Good day. You are here for the webinar, The Art of Strategically Planning GIS Solutions. My name is David Holstock. I'm CEO of a company called Geographic Technologies Group. I have been developing GIS strategic plans for about 24 years. I've written a couple of books, worked with a numerous organizations on winning awards for GIS implementation. And as you can see from this brief resume, I've managed a lot of projects, worked with a lot of local governments in North America and outside of, of, of America, um, and um, feel qualified enough to talk about strategic planning and the art of strategic planning. So that said, I just wanted to let you know that um, our experience is wide and vast with over 700 clients at uh, 24 years in business and um, a lot of successful national awards and international awards related to GIS strategic implementation planning. So the question I have for you all the listening today is where will you be in five years? You know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, uh, I am um, a strategic planner by trade. And I'm always looking at what the next five to 10 years hold, holds. So it's important for us to, um, to consider that. Now, when we write strategic plans, I just wanted to give you the foundation before we got into some of the key issues. When we write strategic plans, there are three phases and you can see the three tabs. There's phase one, which is a lot of data gathering. So if anybody's listening to this uh, or watching this presentation and you're, you, you're working on a work plan or a roadmap or a strategic plan, I think it's important to recognize that phase one, which is looking at your existing situation, looking at your maturity, looking at you know everything you're doing is really important, but also a technology seminar and then analyzing gaps maturity of the organization and then will be benchmarking and consensus building thrown in there in the early stages. And then of course, phase one really is documenting the needs um, of the organization. And that's extensive. And I've just spent, you know, 30 seconds discussing something that usually takes a couple of months. But you end up with with a uh, tools that benchmark where the organization is. So in this example, you can see you, you should be able to identify where you are with governance, where you are with digital data, procedures, software, training, and infrastructure. And you really can create a dashboard of that. And that's the type of thing you would want to do to your, your organization. So, so now I'm getting to the art of strategically planning solutions and, and, and kind of visions, as it were. But that's phase one of any before you can do anything, you've got to you've got to conduct phase one, which is the day together. And the second part is the system design. Where are you going for the next five years? And that's where you'll need to talk about um, your governance model. You'll need to talk about that digital data and databases, the accuracy and reliability of all of them, and the new information you're going to be picking up in the future. You're going to be looking at procedures, workflow integration, or interoperability. Which business system should you be integrating with? You're going to be looking at the GIS ecosystem, the ESRI ecosystem, you know, of desktop, web, and mobile solutions. You're going to be looking at the IT infrastructure, cloud-based, premise-based, and there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of moving parts here. And then, as you can see in Pillar 6, you've got to somehow have a training, education, and knowledge transfer plan. So in your system design, You've got to have all of those things. Now, you could argue all of them are the art of strategic planning and strategically deploying software solutions. And, and there may be, you know, but I'll get to what I think the art of strategic planning is in just a second. But then phase three, once you've you know, done your needs assessment and you've actually put together your system design is step seven. Now, step seven is particularly important to us all. It's the return on investment. It's the value proposition. Then you've got to deploy your strategic plan and then present that and sell that to decision makers. Now, I've just gone through something that usually takes me about two hours to go through. Um, and I just wanted to give you that foundation of strategic planning because we can't get to the solutions without doing that. Believe me, it serves no purpose on, and I've seen this happen before, is quickly rushing to deploy solutions without having those pillars 
in place because it's all going to come tumbling down. Now, the question you may ask, OK, David, so what is the art of strategic GIS planning um, in local government? Well, the art is, number one, is to listen and analyze. Uh, you know, like a goal without a plan is just a wish. So you can have as many wishes as you want, but you've got to plan it. You've got to educate, okay? And now, what, who was it? it? said, educate the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Aristotle said that. So there's more to this. So you've got to listen, you've got to analyze. You know, when I was talking about analyzing, I was talking about, you know, the needs, the gaps we talked about. But you've got to educate and inform because people in your organization don't know what GIS is. They don't know what location intelligence is. But they don't know what automated vehicle location is. They don't know what you mean by drone imagery, you know, all of those things. So there is an education component. Building consensus is part of the art. You must build consensus. Who was it? It was Charles Darwin who said, in the long history of mankind, those who have learned to collaborate and improve most efficiently have prevailed. And then I think Theodore Roosevelt said, the most important single ingredient in the formula for success is knowing how to get along with people. Building consensus is really important. Don't ignore these things. You can put plans together, but don't ignore them. You must align your vision for GIS with the, the, uh, the vision, goals, and objectives of your organization. I've looked at GIS strategic plans and solutions for software, and they just don't align with the vision of the organization. And the vision of an organization is the utmost. Number five, You've got to create your own GIS vision, goals, and objectives, but not just that. You've got to create key performance indicators. Then number six, you've got to sell GIS and local uh, and location intelligence. You've got to be able to tell the story. That's really important. That's another two-hour session. Now, I read those six out because I believe they are all mixed in with the art of strategic GIS planning. But if you strip away all that noise, you get to one thing, number seven, present the value and the benefits. Let's break those out then. Now it's taken 20 years for me to, or us, our team, to put these things together. I've worked hard myself on putting these types of benefits together just so you have a game plan. You know, it just doesn't come in your head, oh, the benefit is we improve this. At least we have a game plan. We have a list of the operational benefits, the organizational, technical, tactical, and community and environmental benefits. This is the art of it, you know, because when you're talking about GIS, you can get into the IT side of it, you can get into the data schemas and data models and local information model, but decision makers gloss over on those types of things. They're looking at this. Okay, so what does this do for me, this GIS stuff? Well, from an operational standpoint, you say, we can see improved efficiency. We can see increased productivity. We can streamline business um, operations. We can modernize thinking. We can make better quality, more effective decisions. We can improve cost department, departmental thinking. We can improve communication, collaboration, coordination. We can respond more quickly to citizen requests we can have more effective management of asset and resources. There you go. There was, what, 60 seconds. But you've got to hang some details on those things. This is just a template for how you talk about GIS, but you've got to find examples. So they're operational benefits. Then we look at organizational benefits. So you should be able to say, well, save lives, time, and money. We comply with state and federal mandates. We inform and educate stakeholders. We improve, we accelerate, and we boost capacity planning. We provide data to regulators, developers, and any other interested parties. We have new and effective ways to present data and information. Wow, do we? Then we can track people, we can track vehicles, resources, events, and assets. You know we're doing that. We can maintain, monitor, and model organizational assets as well. Model ready, GIS, model ready for water, sewer, storm, water, lake, for gas. Technical and tactical benefits. You can, we're going to, with GIS, we're going to, with GIS technology and geospatial technology, we're going to improve data accuracy. 
We're going to automate workflows. We're going to improve information processing, enhance data analytics, big data, visualize planning scenarios, 3D, 3D modeling, it's all 3D, engineer technology strategies, computerize manual procedures, identify, locate, detect, analyze, predict, and quantify impacts. You know you can do all of that. We can monitor real-time critical events. Cool. What about community environmental benefits? We can prioritize environmental stewardship just by using GIS. We can protect the community. You know we can. We can promote economic growth. We can promote open and transparent government. We can improve citizen access. We can empower and engage residents. We can monitor climate conservation and environmental change. We can establish economic, societal, and environmental sustainability. Resilience and sustainability is really important moving forward. I mean, if you think about what's going to happen in the future, um, it's a connected technology ecosystem. It's sustainability and resilience. It's the culture. It's economic, environmental, and social. It's all of that. That's another whole presentation. We can foster social equity, social justice, social equality, and livable communities. Enormous in this day and age. Promote cultural en enrichment and education. Preserve and promote historic resources and help build resilient communities. And there you have it. There's 40. Now, I point the finger right at anybody listening to this presentation. And we're basically saying is, my guess is at best, there are your benefits. There are the 40 at the bottom. You know, on the, on the Y, it's a scale of one to 10. It could be one to 100. On the X axis at the bottom is those 40 I've just talked about. The bar chart is just to say, this is a hypothetical city. This is probably at best what you're doing with GIS. But you have to build a plan to turn that bar chart, i.e. one example of improved efficiency, three examples of responding more quickly to citizen requests, et cetera, to this. That's your goal. And that's not GIS thinking. That's location intelligence thinking. How do you derive information from GIS to think better and improve operations. That's what it's about, okay? Now, I have just spent 12, nearly 13 minutes giving you more information than you care to think about. Let's say, just for conversation then, those 40 are fantastic and you can build around that. What if I changed the language? What if I said, okay, GIS does all of that, but GIS also educates? It empowers, it automates, it monitors, it streamlines, it innovates, it encourages, it promotes, it preserves, it informs, it improves. You know it does all of that. And you know you're not managing all of that. You're not monitoring, you're not quantifying, and you're not spending enough time to discuss these things to secure funding for the future. Really, we're in the smart city, smart community arena. We're just geospatially enabling those smart organizations. Now, you know all that happens. This is a whole different conversation with just different language. And you may say, well, give me examples then. Well, well, well let's look at some examples. How does GIS empower? Well, my city services application deployed empowers citizens. A community GIS portal empowers citizens, residents, and any other interested party in accessing information they could not normally get to. Getting to know your city council, that's empowering citizens because we're now deploying story maps about the community. My neighborhood services, you move to a city, we've got access to my neighborhood services, whether it's when's trash pickup, you know, what parking is like, what anything is like, we now can empower. We can also educate. We can educate with walking tours, with infrastructure information, departmental education. I mean, for example, in public works departments, utilities departments, they need to know the age of pipes, the condition of pipes, the size of pipes. And GIS is all about education. What about heritage trail map? That's educating residents. What about a climate and environmental action plan? Wow, we just finished that project for the city of Thousand Oaks is spectacular because it's how to use GIS for climate change. And it demonstrates what communities are doing and impacting climate change. So we can educate massively. 
we can streamline processes. We know we can streamline, you know, with regards to infrastructure information, as built drawings, instead of going to those drawer, those um, file drawers to get information, we're automating it. We're seeing video of underground pipes. We're seeing images of parcels. We're seeing analytical tools now that just streamlines the process of closing a valve and saving water. We're actually identifying outages. It also automates. We know it automates from automating where people are in the field, automating the process of where they should go to work, about stormwater management and where infrastructure is, flooding story maps, capital projects, automating a manual process. We're monitoring people, we're monitoring vehicles, we're monitoring where crash information is. We're looking at traffic volumes in real time. We're monitoring permits. We're monitoring public ve safety vehicles, police vehicles, the speed of vehicles, accidents. So the monitoring is massive. We're innovating. We're creating maps about cold cases. We're creating three-dimensional maps. We're building 3D models. We're building crime analytics we've never seen before. We've got Ripper in California, racial and identity profiling dashboard, spectacular. That identifies what every police officer is doing, when they're doing it and how they're doing it from a racial standpoint. We're encouraging people to use parks. We're encouraging people to use recreation. We're using tools to inform people about recreation use. We're building hub solutions to share open data and information with the public. We're building green city, open space recreation solutions for data sharing. We're promoting, we're promoting parks, we're promoting special events. We are promoting economic development and we're promoting city development. It's enormous what we're doing. And there's just a few. We're preserving natural resources. We're preserving our history. We're preserving historic buildings. We're preserving the aesthetics of, of cities. We're informing by accessing transportation information. We're looking at in real time hurricane tracking. We're looking at floodplains. We're looking at flood areas. We're looking at recycle areas and garbage pickup. We're also starting to innovate and improve. And as you can see, from this graphic here, this is where essentially we're all going to be in the 3D mode. We're moving from a 2D world into a 3D world. And that 3D world is really important because we're taking LIDAR data, we're building, build, we're putting buildings together in 3D, we're overlaying zoning. We're overlaying land use, we're overlaying crime, permits. We're looking at underground infrastructure. We're looking at our natural resources and parks. We're looking at trees. We're looking at everything as a valuable asset that has a value. We're rendering buildings. We're moving out of the 2D world into the 3D world. And no words can do this justice, because when you get to the point you talk about the benefits, we're talking about the enormous benefits of not having a 2D model, a 3D model, because people want to see what their city looks like, and they want visuals, and they want to see what buildings look like from different angles. And it's enormous what we're doing with, with all of this 3D modeling. But it's exciting. But as you can see, just from this slight video, now we're starting to put underground infrastructure in and we're linking information. Underground infrastructure may be six feet underground. So we're linking information, we're linking all of the videos we have. So everything is a model of your world. And this is where it's all going. This is just a quick sample I wanted to show you, essentially of, of how we're improving GIS and how we're moving forward with everything. And then essentially, let's look at finally, what are the takeaways? The takeaways from today's meeting, as brief as it was, is I want you to have an understanding of the value proposition of GIS and location intelligence. 
and be able to utilize this information to plan and prioritize initiatives. I'm trying, what we were trying to do in 20 years is embrace the top 40 value proposition categories and make good use of them. Sorry. And then appreciate and understand the language used to present the value proposition of GS and secure buy-in from stakeholders. And then understand the value of many deployed GIS solutions from around North America and the impact on local government. Understand where we're going with all of this because it's absolutely fantastic. If anybody would like to reach out to me and ask about planning or just talk about GIS, I'll be delighted to talk to you about all of these things. This is kind of what I do. GIS is turning into sophisticated location intelligence and is changing the world. So we're in a very exciting place and I thank you for listening to today's presentation and I think I've kept it within 25 minutes. So thank you very much.